Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Hello and welcome back. You're listening to The Blockchain Show. I'm your host, Ethan Kinderconnect. And today we've got Justin Rice, the head of ecosystem for the Stellar Development Foundation joining us. Justin, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ethan. I'm happy to be here. It's great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And maybe the best way to get started would be tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with Stellar and the blockchain. Sure. Uh, I have been working on Stellar related projects for a little over two years. Um, I started out working not for the Stellar Development Foundation, but for a company that was building on Stellar called Lightyear. And I was working on an exchange interface for the Stellar Decentralized Exchange. Stellar, if you're not aware, has built-in order books. So um, Stellar makes it easy to issue any kind of asset. It's sort of an asset agnostic platform. And asset issuance is a core feature of the protocol. But in addition to making it possible to issue assets, it also makes it so that you can put, put offers in um, to buy or sell assets, to trade assets, essentially. And those trades are automatically executed via built-in order books. So my first project building on Stellar was uh, I was working to create an exchange interface, sort of like a E-Trade-like interface for the Stellar Decentralized Exchange. And that's actually where I, I sort of first dove into blockchain. Um, before that, I, w- I was working for a, a dating website and working on, on product stuff at the dating website. So I came in sort of working on a Stellar-related product. The reason why I came into blockchain was because I have known Jed McCaleb, who is the chief architect at the Stellar Development Foundation for a long, long time, long before blockchain. And I've, I became aware of blockchain through him. Um, you know, over the years, he was building projects related to Bitcoin and then to Ripple and then finally to Stellar. And so I, I'd always had conversations with him about blockchain, the potential, why it's, why, why it's exciting. But really, uh, it was always sort of like in the back of my mind or just, you know, Jensen has interesting ideas. And so it was always, I I always enjoyed talking with him about it, but it wasn't until about two, two, two and a half years ago that I really like dove in. Um, And the reason why I dove in is because essentially there was a need to build this product. And I, along with several other people were brought in to help create it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, You know, ecosystem is a, it's a term that we kind of just throw around here a lot on the podcast over the last couple of years, but I never really took the time to to think about it. How, how would you describe an ecosystem in regards to the Stellar Development Foundation? I think there are a number of different ways to think about what an ecosystem is. I mean, essentially an ecosystem are the, the sort of participants, the, the various kinds of of businesses, organizations, developers, individuals, and enthusiasts who interact with the blockchain. I mean, blockchain generally is a, is a platform that you can do things with. And so in the most broad way, the ecosystem is sort of anyone who interacts with any kind of blockchain. Specifically in terms of my role, what we focus on, what my team focuses on are businesses, developers, organizations, and individuals who are building on Stellar. And so the goal of being head of ecosystem, what does that mean? It means that my team helps those people understand how to use Stellar, uh, helps inspire them to do good things with it, helps them interact to grow transaction volume. And our goal is to sort of support the network and make it so that a lot of different people with a lot of different interests can take advantage of it. Stellar is open source and open participation. So anyone can start using the technology, using the platform. And our team tries to facilitate usage and encourage people to find interesting things to do. Yeah, that's excellent. I was listening to uh, a podcast. I think it was about, uh, it was a doctor. I think he was speaking with with someone from from the news media. uh, And they were kind of talking about just alternative forms of media and and websites that can't be stopped because of some, some issues that they were having. And they were throwing around terms like blockchain and he was saying, well, no, that's, it wouldn't, you wouldn't need blockchain. You would need decentralization and kind of like Bitcoin. And I was like, well, you know, blockchain is kind of part of Bitcoin. And so it's, it's just kind of interesting to, to hear that 
those, those terms get into the, the public domain, but we're still a little bit unclear, you know, um, the, the general public, I mean, about these terms and, and, and what all this means. So um, I, I was wondering uh, what your take on sort of uh, the, the development of this technology in, in everyday people's lives over the last several years and um, maybe just some trends that you've noticed in, uh, with your work there. In general, I think that the word blockchain is a buzzword for the general public. Uh, for those of us who work in the industry, I think we have very specific understandings of what it is, how it works, what's important, and what it can do. But out there in the world, I, I think that there's, for most people, it has not yet hit their lives. Um, all the potential that we see is just now being realized in a way that makes sense to people who are not fully invested or immersed in the industry. But I do think that there are trends that indicate that blockchain as, as a technology is really starting to make inroads and to become popularly adopted. I think, you know, the, the, the rise in interest in Bitcoin uh, is, is an example of that. The rise in DeFi and automated market makers, which give individuals the opportunity to provide liquidity. Um, that's an example of that. For Stellar, the example is, is quite clear, which is that Stellar is a platform that connects to all the world's currencies and allows them to interoperate on a single platform, which means that it's really easy to make cross-border payments, and cross-currency payments. And what we're seeing is that there are a lot more regions where there are anchors. Anchors are what we, in the Stellar world, call, uh, call basically the on-off ramps that issue tokenized versions of local fiat currencies. We're seeing more and more anchors um, and more and more apps that take advantage of those anchors to offer people in specific markets, specific regions, a way to get onto the network and then to take advantage of sort of the, the transmutability or, or the, 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 ass, the ability to convert assets and, tra and transfer assets uh, really easily. So I think for me, what, what I look at in terms of Stellar is the number of transactions that sort of meaningfully impact people's lives. And we definitely see a, a continuing increase in those transactions. There are more people, for instance, in Europe who are making remittance payments back to Nigeria using uh, uh, applications using uh, th that are built on Stellar. And th those volumes, the volume of those remittance payments has continued to increase. And so for me, those people... Uh, often they, they don't need to know that they're using blockchain, but blockchain in the background gives them an easy, fast, cheap, secure way to make those transactions. And I think ultimately those are the trends, you know, in addition to sort of the awareness of blockchain, which, you know, the sort of Bitcoin and AMMs point to, I think there's also an increasing amount of uh, products that are being built to take advantage of blockchain that to consumers look just like normal consumer financial products. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's it's really, really cool. I encourage anybody to um, check out stellar.org um, just to kind of further their knowledge after our conversation here is over. You, know, you mentioned um, people sending money and uh, remittances and how they wouldn't necessarily be aware of the the technology underneath. It's pretty powerful. You know, it just kind of reminds me of the early days of the internet where it came in over the phone lines and a lot of, uh, it was a hassle, but eventually it, things kind of switched around where I think most phone calls go over the internet now. And which is just kind of funny because my um, father-in-law worked for AT&T for a long time and he was very against Bitcoin. You know, he's like a traditionalist in the markets and and I, and I just, we kind of talked a little bit about the internet and the evolution there. And I, I thought, you know, don't you think that maybe the same thing could happen to, uh, to finance and um, gave him that example. And he kind of thought about it. And then they had some people, I uh, maybe friends or, or their friends, children, uh, you know, trading, I think it was Bitcoin at the time of the first bull run. And you know, they made so much money that they could buy a house. And then, so all of a sudden there's this 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 thing that bought something in the real world, it's still such a, a weird thing for a lot of people to to wrap their heads around. But it's, it, I think it is gaining momentum. And um, sorry for the for the for the story here, but um, it just kind of that the, when you were talking about um, 
Africa, we had on a, a guest who was who was helping people, and it just reminded me about the uh, the payment layers and how in most Western countries we have so much access to to different payments. But um, you know, we, and we hear a lot about the unbanked, and I, it, I guess it makes my question is it makes me wonder like how difficult is it for people who who can't get a, a website, or I'm sorry, not a website, a bank account rather, to um, you know, to use something like uh, a cryptocurrency or, or uh, an alternative form of, of finance. Do you think that there's like the on-ramps to, to using the, the newer forms of, of financial, I guess you would call them products? Um, do, you, do you think that there's just as much barriers to cryptocurrencies as there are to say, um, you know, getting a bank account? Generally, no. I think there, there are still the same challenges because a lot of the times when you're talking about fiat currency, you're beholden to regulations. It is with good reason regulated jurisdiction by jurisdiction. And so, you, you know, you want to make sure that, that when you're dealing with actual transfer of funds, or that, that there are measures in place to prevent, you know, money laundering and terrorist financing. And I think that you know, all th- those are there with good reason, but they also create obstacles to to access. They do create barriers. And so there has to be a certain amount of friction, right? But I think with blockchain, there is the potential to reduce that friction so that it doesn't impact people who are uh, it, it, based on where they're born or, or how much money they start with. Um, it, you know, the, the, the saying that it's expensive to be poor is... Is true. A lot of the times, if you're trying to, if if you happen to be, you know, depending on where you're from, and and what sort of what your financial background is and what kind of means you start with, sometimes you're forced to to transact in a way that's like slow and more expensive. And so I think that while there will continue to be some amount of necessary protections um, that create barriers barriers to access generally, by reducing the friction involved in in a lot of cross border or cross currency payments, and in making it so that you can access financial infrastructure without actually needing a branch location, right? Like you can do it with your cell phone. Um, I, I think that it will get a lot easier in most of the world, and it will increase access, make access to financial infrastructure more equitable. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you for um, explaining that because yeah, I'm just trying to imagine what it would have been like to uh, to move to this country and not have much of anything, let alone, you know, I, I, I don't even know how difficult it is to, to go through traditional financial systems. I mean, you got to prove you live somewhere or, you know, it's just like, just to echo what you're saying, you know, it's the, it's uh, expensive to be poor. I can I totally, totally understand what you mean there. Um, for some people, it must just be like a never ending cycle. And, um, you know, I've got some, you know, basics for, what would you call it? First world problems, like college debt and stuff like that. But, um, thinking about, uh, you know, just get back to our, our, uh, topic here of remittances, sending money, back home, say, uh, for someone, they have to go through these intermediaries like you were talking about. And, you know, there must be so much money. I don't even know how much billions of dollars each year that's just kind of lost to the intermediaries. So I was wondering if you could just um, ex- maybe expand a little bit on on the the, the challenges with traditional remittances and, and how Stellar's going to help people uh, with that. Essentially, the way that current remittances work is that there's a, there's there are these complicated systems that are cobbled together to allow a payment to to you know from from an origin to reach its destination. Um, usually, there are correspondent banks involved, which means that if you're initiating payment from say Europe and it uh, terminates in Nigeria, um, in order to move from euros to Nigerian naira and to move across all the borders, you're not you're not actually making a payment from. The, the origin bank to the destination bank. The origin bank is basically working with an intermediary who's probably working with an intermediary and maybe another intermediary in order to like sort of move the payment one hop at a time. And along the way, there are fees. Um, there's a lot of value lost, as you pointed out, uh, not only in, in sort of the intermediary fees, but also in, in often in fund conversion. And there are uh, difficulties that come because of the, the systems that those correspondence banks, correspondent banks use to communicate. Basically, they can 
say that they want to make a payment, but the, the, the signaling of that payment and the actual uh, completion of the payment are, are separate acts. And you end up not only with those costs, but also with slow close times because of all these different jurisdictions with different requirements and different time zones. Um, and you end up with issues settling at the end because it's actually complicated to keep track of all those ledgers. And so what Stellar does is it, it creates a network where essentially you can, the network itself can transmute the value as you send it. So an origin, uh, again, what we call anchor and on-off ramp can essentially connect to a destination on-off ramp and the network will handle, they can send directly from one to another and the network itself through the decentralized order books will handle the conversion. And so rather than having to set up to make a payment by hop, 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 you can make a payment from A directly to B. And because it's happening in this decentralized way and because the stellar ledger close times, right, are three to five seconds, that payment takes seconds instead of days. Um, and so essentially a lot of the friction created by the correspondent banking system is replaced by a more efficient platform single platform for currency interoperation. Excellent. Yeah, and the, that term anchor, that was kind of a, a new concept to me that I haven't seen, I haven't seen yet instead of um, using like a, the, the anchor system to, to use like the know your customers for different local, um, uh, you know, locations and their, uh, le, uh, whatever the rules would be. Um, how would you describe the, this, the, this anchor opportunity to someone who, who might not really know much about that? So anchors are essentially licensed, regulated financial institutions, generally like money service businesses, fintech companies, sometimes banks. Um, they often issue or give access to stable coins, which essentially are digital representations of some local currency. Most of the companies that end up anchoring an asset do so because there is some business advantage to them doing so. So a lot of the times, just to take the example that I gave earlier of the, of the payment corridor from a remittance payment corridor from Europe to Nigeria, that corridor has been created by two companies that are building on the Stellar network. On the Europe side, there's a company called Tempo that issues a Euro token on Stellar. And on the Nigerian side, there is a company called Cowrie that issues a Nigerian Naira token on Stellar. And because those, both of those uh, companies are involved in the remittance business. So they can sort of use the efficiency of Stellar to interact directly. Um, when a customer makes a payment from Europe to Nigeria, essentially uh, they, they give them, you know, they sort of deposit the money with or hand the money. You can do it over the counter, you can do it over the website, but to, to Tempo, who then converts it to Naira, on the Stellar network, and that Naira is then withdrawn via Cowrie to the recipient's bank account. Um, for both Tempo and Cowrie, they are able to drive payments, like to, to get more customers, because they can offer more efficient payments, faster and cheaper to their customers. But it's also for them, they, it's, it's a more profitable way to run their businesses. So anchors generally have a, a sort of business related concern that leads them to issue an asset on the network. And generally it's because they're offering a service or a product uh, to consumers or to businesses that um, takes advantage of Stellar. And so th there's like sort of efficiency that, that allows the anchor to have a better business. And that ultimately as part of their advantage, they serve a better product, usually cheaper and faster to the uh, end, end user. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very good. Very, very useful. And I was impressed that Stellar was created in 2014, which I think is before Ethereum. Is that right? It's around the same time. Yeah, I, 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 that's actually a really good question. And one that I will look up after this yes, interview. Yes, somewhere, somewhere around there. I think a lot of people are familiar with Ethereum by now. Uh, especially if they're listening to this podcast, we... um. I think we almost named the podcast the Ethereum show, but we decided to uh, settle on the buzzword, which you're very accurate in describing blockchain as the buzzword. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's something that, you know, when we look at the history of, of mankind's uh, 
record keeping ledgers goes back a long ways and the whole idea of, of cheating or, or trying to alter a ledger. Um, I know that I, I think my, I was, I, I shouldn't say the name of the bank, but it was a big one. I, I left it a few years back because they were just so unhonest with, um, I was kind of broke at the time. So every time I would get an overdraft notice, I would run to the ATM and put in enough cash to cover it. And I, this one particular time I just kept getting pinged. So I, I took like two or three trips to the ATM one day and I had the receipts to prove that I was covering myself, but they, they did some clever, uh, you know, cooking of the books, if you will. And, and they decided that I didn't cover it in time. So they charged me like, it was like, it was like $200 worth of, um, overdraft fees and I went in and I argued with the guy and I was showing him the receipts and I, and then he's like yeah man you're right but uh you know, there's nothing I can do because the system is showing that that you didn't that, you know that you didn't have enough money in there so I just left and I was like I'm done dude like we're gonna <laughs> I, I, ouch yeah that hurts and that's the thing right like is that is that there are and it's true that the person that you talked to probably had no control over the situation. And the sort of thing that takes the blame there is the system, right? So what is the system? The system in that case is some proprietary black book ledger that they keep with all kinds of rules attached that you, I'm sure you agree to with some kind of like t terms of service that you signed one way or another, but it is not transparent. It's not necessarily fair. And it's not set up to handle disputes necessarily very well, or at least not in a way that's favorable in that case to you. So it's, you know, th th this idea that finances should fully be controlled by gatekeepers and that ledgers should be something that they keep and they can amend, but they're not accountable to, to you to sort of demonstrate the, the veracity of them. And those ledgers aren't transparent, basically, is increasingly strange. Um, and I think that if the world understands that there's a different way to do it, which again, I, I do believe is happening, I think that it, it is going to transform finance. Yeah, I totally agree. And it was a, ultimately a, a, a positive experience despite the, you know, this, the hassle and this, you know, the pain of, at that time, 200 bucks was a lot for me, but um, it set me down this path of trying to become unbanked, which I'm almost there, getting, getting a lot closer. It's, uh, I just have to get my wife on board and, and I think we can finally do it. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's tough. She had, she had some crypto from back in the day and lost her keys and man, I wonder how much it would have been worth now. But anyways. Yeah, that's a real, that's a real, there are some real concerns and there are some real, basically general product issues with crypto. It's general, it's not acceptable to most people that you can lose your key and lose all your money. There are you know, people expect some recourse. And I think one interesting idea moving forward for anyone building products on crypto is to find better solutions to key management. If it comes down to you have to keep your keys, it, it can't just be something that you write on, on a slip of paper at, as your final backstop. And I think that there are some, there is some interesting work going on to try to figure out better ways to make it easy for normal, well, really for anyone to keep track to not lose access to their accounts. Um, what, it's actually interesting. I, you know, one of the products that's built on Stellar is called Vibrant. It's a, it's a wallet that essentially uh, is focused on Argentina. It allows Argentinians to access dollar savings so they can keep a balance in USD and sort of convert small amounts on, as needed to Argentinian pesos uh, as, a, as a safeguard against inflation, essentially. But Vibrant has really been trying to, to push the limits in terms of creating a user-friendly experience. And one of the interesting things that came out of that is um, the, on Stellar, there are these things that are called Stellar ecosystem proposals. They're essentially standards that different companies and products building on Stellar can implement in order to interoperate and interact. So, if, you know, everyone sort of follows these same standards. And one of the standards that Vibrant came up with and drove was, uh, is, is a key management solution. And essentially, it makes it so that you can distribute ownership of the key without giving control of the account to several different entities. And I know there's work being done like this in, in other blockchains and in other places too. Uh, 
And so it makes it so that you can really sign on to a, a Stellar account, for instance, just by keeping track of just using your phone um, or your email. And I think that there is a world in which this problem of I lost my key and I lost everything will, will be solved. And solving those kinds of problems, I think, is, is, a, is, is one of the huge things to, to sort of overcome the obstacles to broad adoption of blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a very good point. You know, earlier today I was reading about the Stellar Lumens, and I I think it's a great concept, but one that I I don't think I could really explain to someone. How would you? How, how could you? Maybe could you just describe to us just a little bit more in a better detail than I ever could about the the Stellar Lumens? Sure. Stellar is set up to, as as I mentioned earlier. Stellar is really set up to be a network and a platform that allows you issuance of universal currencies. So the idea is that all of the world's currencies, and we're getting there, will be issued on Stellar so that you can make these easily make, you know, cross-border, cross-currency payments. However, it's, the, the network, you know, is also a distributed database, right? So it stores information. And when I say it, I actually mean people who participate in the network by running Stellar nodes, uh, which are the computers that keep track of the ledger, they store all this ledger data, right? So essentially, you, if you build a network that stores data and that connects people so that they can transact with one another, inevitably you run into the problem of misuse of, of the ledger and spam. So if you, a free database, right, people can just store arbitrary information. And if because you can transact on Stellar without running your own, no own node, uh, you can basically interact with it with public access points. If there was no cost to storing information on that ledger, the ledger would become bloated with all kinds of irrelevant data, right? And that, that, that isn't related to payments. And the, the cost of that would be borne by the people who operate the network infrastructure. So there has to be some minimal cost to store, you know, some amount of friction to, to using the ledger and storing data on the ledger. And likewise, there has to be some minimal cost to transacting on the ledger uh, because you don't want people to be sending transactions that are essentially spam. Um, for instance, in Stellar, you can uh, attach a memo to a transaction. And if transactions are totally free, you can use those memos essentially, you know, to, to send out links you know, phishing links or, or just links to a terrible website. So how do you create some amount of friction to ensure that the ledger doesn't become bloated and that people use it to transact in some meaningful way? You create a, a fee, essentially, uh, some cost associated with transacting, with having an account and transacting on the ledger. And what in the design of Stellar, the decision was to have a native network currency called the Lumen that covers those fees. So a transaction on Stellar costs 100 Stroops, which is one ten millionth of a Lumen, so very, very little. And to have an account cost, uh, you, you, you requires a reserve balance of one Lumen. And then to do things like hold another asset, you increase your Lumen balance by half a Lumen. Oh, that's just a long way of saying in order to have an account or transact, you, you, it requires a certain small amount of lumens. They're just really deterrents for bad behavior. There is a secondary advantage to lumens, which is that because the network requires lumens, anyone who transacts on the network requires lumens, and lumens are sort of built into the logic of the network, uh, they also serve as a bridge currency. And by that, I mean, as I've said, the goal of, of this universal platform is to make it easy to transmute currencies from one to another, to send euros and have them arrive as Nigerian Naira. Sometimes when you're trying to, in order to do that, you have to have liquidity, right? You have to be able to essentially trade euros for Naira. But as the number of currencies multiplies on Stellar, there may not always be direct liquidity between two assets. But there will always be liquidity between an asset and lumens. And so you can use lumens as a bridge asset to say, transfer, you know, convert euros to lumens and lumens to Naira. In the, in the, actually, in the, in the euros to Naira case, there is a direct market. But, you know, say there's, you know, 
South African rand and you're trying to change that to, you know, Chinese yuan, there may not, in cases where there is not a direct market, lumens can serve as an intermediary bridge asset, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's super interesting because I know that, um, you know, for some people, the whole concept of um, tokens, cryptocurrencies is more more or less just like trading and they treat them like stocks and they oftentimes have no idea of the utility, which is, uh, you know, good for them. That some people are, that's that's their thing. Um, I always, I'm always like really intrigued about, you know, why was this created and what's what's the utility here? So, you know, I, I just, I, sometimes I wonder like, do, do people realize what's actually like the potential of this technology or, or are they just trying to like get rich and then trade it quickly? Yeah, I think there's a lot of both. Um, w- will that continue forever? I don't know. Uh, but for me, what always interests me is the underlying technology and how the asset plays in or, or supports the underlying technology. In some cases, I think that the technology is just to support the asset, but in a lot of cases, the native network token, whatever it is, serves a, a, it has a utility. It serves a purpose. And the important thing or the interesting thing, I think, to understand is, is what is the purpose? What does the network do? It's the same thing with like ETH. Um, you know, Ethereum exists to, to be, to, to run, to, to allow for these sort of distributed programs to run. Um, not to be uh, something that somehow creates value for ETH, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, absolutely. E- Ethereum is 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 a pretty pretty cool technology that one that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. But like most most blockchains out there, it's it's complex and um, it can be reduced down to like a more digestible bit of information. Um, but sometimes just I don't know. I'm just I'm just always amazed of just how this technology can be used and in just the ways, just the crafty ways humans come up with, with new, new use cases. And, um, you know, I'm just in the, in the few moments we have or minutes, I'm not sure how long you can go, but, um, I, I, like we talked about earlier, um, I think we we're talking about, uh, you know, blockchain being the underlying technology of Bitcoin that most people were not aware of that. And, um, kind of, you know, brilliant in it's in a sense that it's, it was the first and, you know, the, the, the incentive for miners to, uh, to make all of these nodes. Uh, but in terms of uh, like internet cash, which I think was the original intent, it kind of in, in some regards has failed to um, deliver on that. Uh, people have called it like the, the currency of last resort. Um, like we mentioned earlier, it's very volatile. I've been watching it go up and down lately just to kind of keep myself amused. But uh, one thing that was interesting about the uh, the lumen supply, um, you know, it's it's not. I, th- I think if I'm not mistaken here, it's not mined or awarded by uh, you know the protocol over time. But I think instead, it's there's there's more there was more like a reserve of, of lumens created, and there's some sort of like inflationary aspect to it where it increases by design. No. There is no inflationary aspect anymore. Um, originally, there was an inflationary aspect, but the the nodes on the network voted to essentially, uh, well, I'll just, the nodes on the network voted to disable the inflation mechanism. So it's not a deflate. It's not an inflationary currency. Um, lumens were created at the origin of the network, and there are fifty billion of them in existence, and that's the amount of lumens that will sort of ever exist. Uh, the, you know, the Stellar Network is, as I mentioned, it's open participation, open source. And the organization that I work for, which is called the Stellar Development Foundation, is a nonprofit organization. Our goal is to uh, create equitable access to the world's financial infrastructure. And in order to do that, we support and help grow the Stellar Network. Um, the all of the initial lumen supply started in the hands of the Stellar Development Foundation. And the foundation has a very explicit mandate where we have certain amounts of those lumens allocated to certain purposes. And you can actually see it on our mandate page, which if you just search for SDF or Stellar Development Foundation mandate, you can find it um, or just go to stellar.org and look for the mandate. But basically we 
uh, allocate or these lumens and distribute these lumens to uh, to help grow and support the network. Um, that the, there aren't there is no mining incentive for people to run nodes. There are no new lumens created. Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you for um, for correcting me there because that that actually brings up my next question, which I was wondering about. Um, you know, this this aspect of voting on the network because on other blockchains, like you mentioned, there was mining and computers are kind of competing against each other to verify uh, whether or not something's valid. So you know, it kind of stops people from cheating or doing like 51% attacks. Um, you know, in, in your work in the, in the foundation, have you, have you, how many of these instances have you been aware of where there, there is voting on, on these different nodes and, and maybe kind of walk me through how that might work for someone? Well, fundamentally stellar is the protocol for consensus. So obviously all, all blockchains, they need to find a way to add new blocks or, or in our case, new transaction sets to the ledger. And the nodes on the network need to find a way to agree that a valid set of transactions should be applied. In the case of proof of, proof of work like Bitcoin, as you pointed out, computers solve difficult mathematical problems and the winner gets to essentially decide on, on what gets added to the block. In the case of Stellar, the protocol for achieving consensus, which is, surprise, surprise, called the Stellar Consensus Protocol, works fundamentally differently. Um, anyone who runs a node on the Stellar network essentially chooses other nodes on the Stellar network that it adds, that it essentially follows or, or talks to. Um, and it puts them in what's called a quorum set. Um, those quorum sets have sort of thresholds, but what happens is that every round of consensus is a round of voting. So a node sort of in, uh, collects transactions, they pool them into a transaction set, and then the nodes on the network through the Stellar Consensus Protocol vote on the validity of each transaction set. In other words, voting happens to close every ledger. So Stellar Network nodes are voting every three to five seconds. Now, in it, and that's to apply transaction sets to the ledger, right? In addition to voting on the validity of transaction sets and to apply them to the ledger, the nodes on the network also vote on overall network settings. So the minimum fee for the network, the number of transaction operations actually allowed per ledger, um, the version of the protocol that the network runs. And those kinds of votes happen not every three to five seconds. They generally happen when there's a proposed change. So governance-wise, there is, you know, there's a new version of the Stellar protocol um, that has been implemented in the fundamental program that all these nodes run called Stellar Core. And, you know, essentially someone generally for that case, the SDF, we propose to the nodes on the network, hey guys, we have a new version of the software, vote on whether or not you think the network should run it. And that happens a few times a year. So this year there were two major protocol releases, both of which were accepted by the network. Um, I would say that other overall network changes there have maybe been four or five uh, since, since I've been here. There was a change to the number of transactions per ledger. There was a change to the minimum reserve requirement. And I'm trying to, th I, I think there were a couple of others. And, and those changes are less frequent. But again, the way that those work sort of governance wise is that there is, there is this actually happened recently, like, I actually wrote a blog post that said, hey, I think we should increase the network minimum fee and put it out there. And there was a lot of discussion. And as a result, we have we have not yet reached like external consensus about whether we should do that. And if so, how much it should increase. It's an ongoing discussion. Once that discussion sort of comes to its natural end, um, if it seems like something that that people are in agreement with, I might or someone else who's in that discussion might actually propose to the validators on the network, hey, now that we've all sort of come to an agreement about what's sensible, let's change the minimum network fee to X, right? And then it would be proposed and it would be voted on. So, sorry, just long story short, voting is fundamental to the Stellar Consensus Protocol and the nodes on the network vote every three to five seconds to apply transaction sets. The overall network settings get voted on uh, less frequently, but 
the the method for approving those is the same as approving transaction sets. Yeah, very good. That's very interesting. I think that's 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 really um it's really impressive actually. So um I really, really appreciate what you guys are, are working on there. And I know we, we spent a lot of time talking about Stellar. I'm sorry, I meant to ask more questions about the foundation. You know, we're talking about what the foundation does to create more equitable, equitable access to the global financial system. We spoke a little bit about the ecosystem. To speak a little bit more about the, the platform and the infrastructure, I know that you said it's, it's open sourced and decentralized, obviously. Um, but maybe how, how does uh, the SDF help to, de- you know, further development the network? And, um, you know, how, how do you also support Codebase and the, the people who might want to um, build upon it? Great question. I think a really, again, a really good place to look will be the mandate page. Let me just see what that is. It's stellar.org slash foundation slash mandate. So we are very public about, I mean, this sort of shows how we're, we're, we're how we allocate the lumens that we are stewarding to help prop up the network. But it also shows sort of like the areas that we focus on. So I would say the SDF itself has employees uh, and you know contractors that it hires to work on the code base to make sure it's secure, to improve it, um, and to build products that make it easier to take advantage of Stellar. And those range from things like reference implementations of ecosystem standards to Horizon, which is the API that people use to interact with Stellar. But in addition to that sort of direct development, we also uh, spend a lot of time on ecosystem support. So to do that, we, we, uh, we have uh, grants. So there are a number of different kinds of grants that we offer. We offer infrastructure grants, which essentially are, are ongoing, is an ongoing series of grants that supports projects that provide crucial network utility. Uh, we have a community fund, which gives the broader Stellar community the opportunity to vote on which projects deserve lumens. Anyone can enter the community fund with a project built on Stellar, and it runs a, a few times, several times a year. Um, we also have uh, a um, enterprise fund, which is a sort of a strategic investment fund that we use to uh, invest and support projects that are built on Stellar or that are in, uh, implementing Stellar. Um, and, and those are like sort of the main ways that we, through our Lumen allocation, help support projects built on the network. Now, in addition to that, we also have a lot of people at SDF who, as you can imagine, know a lot about Stellar and how it works. We actually have a team, an integration team, that goes out there and helps people with their integrations, helps them get set up, helps speed the process along. And we have a business development team that identifies strategic partners that we can help integrate. So, you know, we're sort of giving grants of various kinds, working on the network ourselves, um, incentivizing people to, to also build on the network and offering assistance and guidance. And now in addition to all that, we also really want to make sure that Stellar is self-serve. So a lot of what my team does, for instance, is we try to keep the documentation as fresh and usable as possible. Because in addition to all the work that we do to help people, like specific organizations, we also want to make it so that anyone can show up and just get started. And so those self-serve resources and documentation and reference implementations are also something that we really focus on. Wow. Yeah, that's that's very impressive. Yeah, I, I see that you're a musician and you're... I always enjoy talking to musicians because I've, you know, I studied recording in um, in college, and um, it just seems like I don't know how to describe this, but there's just like a different, uh, not, not not like a higher consciousness. That sounds kind of <laughs> that's not what I mean to say, but like there's just like a different part of the brain that you're working with, and you know I, your background in, in literature and and movies is like you've had a really really cool life, and I just wonder, so do you foresee any any changes that might benefit? music or movies or, um, or, you know, anything like that, that, the the blockchain might impact? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, so first of all, I think that there is a way in which being a musician really does help with something like blockchain is, especially if you have a role like mine, where you work with an ecosystem, right? So music is about combining a lot of different parts and usually a lot of different musicians to make one sort of synchronous project. 
So the idea of being able to not only participate yourself by adding to the music, but also to collaborate with others and to collaborate towards some greater purpose, which is say a song or a performance where the performance is the goal, right? Not your actual musicianship, your musicianship supports the performance. I feel like that's very much like what my role is here. My goal is to take everything that I can, all the ideas and imagination and effort that I can bring to bear and to help create a beautiful song. Um, in terms of how blockchain can help music and, and movies and things like that, I think there, there are two main ways that I see that happening. One is, is something that something like Stellar could definitely help with, which is people who are really trying to make music or movies, they're, they also live in the real world and have to find a way to get paid. Um, and I think blockchain can make it, can take systems that are pretty inefficient right now, micropayments, for instance, and turn them into efficient systems that get rid of some of the middlemen. So if you are a musician, oftentimes, say you, you, you make royalties off of, uh, off of the songs that you write, and those royalties are coming in a fraction of a cent at a time. And a system that can handle tiny, tiny payments because it's so fast and cheap could probably be leveraged to make those payments a lot more efficient, which would help a musician survive. That's the first way. I think there probably is some method, some kind of blockchain, and it's probably not Stellar, it's probably some other blockchain that could also help with things like you know, rights management so that you could somehow actually, I, I don't know, you know, make it so that when you created something, you could offer it directly to the consumer in a way that didn't just relinquish control of, of your product entirely. And by this, I mean like, you know, you, you, if you make something digitally, whether it's a, a song, say, for instance, because that's what I'm most familiar with, like it'd be cool if you could just sell it for a tenth of a cent instead of give it to someone and all of a sudden it's free to the world. Um, I feel like there's a way in which it could help find this balance where people who are, who are fans or could support uh, the, the artists that they love without this huge, and it would be just as easy as essentially not supporting them, right? Like, I feel like there's potential there. And if it's realized, it could be quite revolutionary, especially for independent artists. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great, man. I'm really excited to see where that goes. I really I really share the, your vision there. And um, yeah, well, Justin, I just wanted to thank you. This talk has been fascinating. I really appreciate you taking the time to explain some of these things to me, and I know the audience will enjoy it. Um, just, um, you know, in closing, maybe I know that we've, we've given out some of the links to, to Stellar and I'll be sure to put those in the show notes, also the foundation. Uh, but, um, if you'd like to leave us with anything, uh, potentially maybe ways to connect or anything like that, uh, please feel free. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, thanks for talking, Ethan. I, I really enjoyed this and I appreciate your, your time and your, and your thoughtful questions. And I also really enjoyed this conversation. So that's, Thank you for that. Um, I think the best place to go just to find is, is to go to stellar.org. And if you navigate around, you'll see that there are different tabs that can lead you to different places. We have, in addition to stellar.org, which is kind of like canonical information about Stellar provided by the SDF, you'll also see that you know there are tabs like the uh, developers tab or the ecosystem tab that will lead you to other uh, channels where Stellar has a really active developer community. And if you want to interact with it, it's really easy to do, but you can find links to sort of all the different channels where people interact um, on stellar.org under the ecosystem or developers tab. So that, that, that's what I would say. Use that as your gateway and explore around. There are a lot of great people out there building on Stellar and they're always excited to have new faces show up. That's great. Audience, if you're listening, please feel free to be some of those new faces. I'm sure we'll, uh, you won't be disappointed. Justin? You know, thanks again, man. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, Ethan.